I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society, and I'm joined today by Dr. Stephanie Fabian. Tell us who you are. Hi, I'm the medical director of the North American Menopause Society, and my day job is the chair of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. So let's focus on what's coming around the corner, what the research is showing us in terms of newer treatment options for women with vasomotor symptoms. Well, it's really exciting. We have a new class of drug out there called the NK3 inhibitors. Um, they seem to be impacting a pathway in the hypothalamus. That's where we think hot flashes originate. And uh, it's very interesting how this class of drug was discovered, but uh, they were looking at families that had a genetic mutation that caused uh, delay uh, in puberty. And they found that this pathway impacted uh, FSH and LH and the LH signaling. And so uh, it, it, they came to find out that indeed vasomotor symptoms seem to originate in this area. Um, so drugs have been developed and there's several in the pipeline right now that impact these receptors specifically that um, have been shown to reduce vasomotor symptoms dramatically within a very short time. So they're not on the market yet, um, so we don't have any readily available, but very exciting and I hope that they meet government approval sometime soon. So it's interesting <clears throat> because they're, they're not an estrogen per se, right. so you wonder whether or not the length of use or the indications will change, but then that leads me to the question about using menopausal estrogen therapy in its more traditional approach and the fact that we then also have positive effect on bone positive effect on GSM. So talk to me a little bit about who you think might be a candidate or might not be a candidate. Right, and, and you're right to say that we don't know the impact on GSM or on bone yet for, for these new chemical compounds. Um, but thinking about it, it's those women who cannot or are afraid to use estrogen uh, who might be the best candidates for that. So if, for example, survivors of breast cancer or other estrogen dependent cancers might be ideal candidates. Uh, for this drug who are having these bothersome hot flashes and night sweats. Um, again, you know, within the first 48 hours or so of taking these compounds, women seem to have a dramatic decrease in hot flashes, so they act really rapidly. But we don't have a lot of long-term safety or efficacy data on these drugs yet, so we really don't know the long-term effect on things like mood or cardiovascular risk. Um, as you mentioned, uh, genital, um, genitourinary symptoms or even bone health. It's promising because it really doesn't, these drugs don't seem to impact FSH, um, which tells us that they may not have an adverse effect on bone, um, but we don't know more than that right now. It's interesting because as we think of many areas of medicine, for example, bone health itself, we often think about high-risk patients having sequential therapies. You start with one, and then you may move over to another, looking at the risk-benefit profile. It, it would be interesting whether or not younger women, for example, who still do need estrogen, particularly premature ovarian failure, might then enter a realm where we begin to look at using sequential medications. That's true. I, I think. I think the best data that we have for these women who go through earlier premature menopause is that they probably do need estrogen if they're is no reason that they shouldn't be taking it. So in other words, for example, an estrogen-dependent cancer would be a reason they shouldn't. Um, but I think for the most part, we, we know the benefits of, of utilizing estrogen therapy in these women. And I'm a bit concerned about uh, abandonment of estrogen for these women who need it. But you have a good point about could there be some sequential therapy there um, utilizing other, other compounds, and we just don't know that yet. You know, it's, it's a curiosity that in all the years we've been talking about menopause and learning about menopause, we still really don't know what a hot flash is. Right. You know, thermoregulatory zone, it's narrower, we, we sort of understand right. that. And, and learning what we have about these so-called candy receptors, mm -hmm. do you think that it's added to the contribution of where the hot flash is originating and how we're absolutely able to focus in a very narrow way on that hot flash? I think it's fascinating. So as you say, the candy neurons, uh, the kispeptin, the dynorphin, the neurokine B, um, uh, seem to run in the hypothalamus. And what's really fascinating, though, is if you look, 
those neurons are also involved with mood and weight. Right. So, so how much this all ties together, the hot flash, the mood changes, the weight changes that occur around the menopause transition, does it have anything to do with this bundle of nerves? It's, it's fascinating, it's thought provoking, and I think we have a lot to learn going forward. But yeah, I think for the first time we are really sort of learning the anatomy of a hot flash. And even though we're not quite there yet, we have come a long way even in the last you know, 10 to 12 years, um, going from figuring out that these, these uh, neurons may be implicated in the timing of onset of puberty to, wow, they may have something to do with the menopausal hot flash and the fact that it seems it is non-hormonal. So, so it's impacting that whole, whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis without really um, being an estrogen drug. It makes you think if it's a little further back, almost like the master switch that turns the light on and then everything else right. cascades from it. Right. It's a fascinating concept. I would imagine that sleep too will be part of that bundle that we'll be seeing. So where do we stand with the research in terms of phase three trials? I'm not going to ask you for a crystal ball when you think we may actually see these, but we seem to be coming closer to this information. Right. I th there are three chemical compounds that have been investigated thus far. One was sort of uh, development was stopped. We still have two more that are being looked at. Uh, they've done dose finding trials and that would have identified the, the appropriate dose. So I think we're really just waiting to see um, when they'll be approved. And, and as you know, uh, we, we just don't know that yet. It, it depends on so many things. But I think this is exciting, and I think um, to have another drug in the mm -hmm. armamentarium for women to use for bothersome menopausal symptoms, it's always a good thing, right? Yeah, and it's opening the door towards more education in, in an area of right. the brain that up until now, we really have not had a lot of study on. Right, and beyond the estrogens, which were approved in the 1940s, this will be the first major class of medications that, that will be approved um, for that are really specific to hot flash management and menopause management. Well, I'll be, promise that I'll be back at you in a year from now yes. when we're sitting down again to see where we stand. I hope so. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.